Good day. Welcome to my talk on sample size estimation for clinical research. I am Samir Parpia, Associate Professor and Biostatistician from McMaster University, and I'm here at Stellenbosch University on a fellowship. So during the talk today, we'll talk about the goals of sample size estimation, go through sample size estimation for clinical trials, as well as surveys and cohorts, and we'll briefly touch on what to report in sample size estimation and go through some examples. So what the goal of sample size estimation is to distill the signal out of the noise. And here the noise is the variation and the signal could be the treatment effect. So on this figure you'll see on the left hand side is the signal for the blue group with the noise being the black lines and on the right is the signal for the red group with the noise being the black lines. And our goal is to get enough number of patients so that we can see this signal in the background of the noise. So here is an example. We have 10 subjects. The mean difference between the two groups, the red and the blue, is 0 0.5, and the standard deviation is 1. When we take the mean and the 95% confidence interval of the two groups, we can see that the means are very close to each other and there is really no difference from this example that we can test. When we take the means and 95% confidence intervals of each of the groups, we can see that there is really no much difference in the means, but that may be just a reflection of the sample size. Let's do the same exercise, but take 100 subjects. The mean difference, again, is 0 0.5, and the standard deviation is 1. And now let's calculate the mean and the 95% confidence interval. And we see that there's a distinct difference in the means, and that is the 0 0.5 that this data was simulated from. So this is just to show that we need enough patients to distill the signal from the noise. If you have too few patients, then you will not be able to see the signal and it will just be clouded by the noise, and by noise we mean variation. And therefore it's important to get enough sample size so that you are able to convincingly detect the signal from the noise. The larger the signal, the easier it is to detect a difference. So the larger the signal, the less number of patients you require for your study because you're looking for a bigger difference. The smaller the noise, so the smaller the variation, the easier it is to detect the difference. So if the variation in the outcome is small, you'll require a smaller number of patients for your study. And this is just showing you that the variation in this particular group is smaller than it was in the previous group. So what is required to estimate a sample size? So first we go through, there's about eight things in general that are required and we'll go through them step by step. So the first in at least a randomized trial setting is the study design. The first is a parallel group redesign where there are two or more groups being compared. The second could be a crossover trial where groups are randomized to get one treatment over the other. And the third could be a factorial where two or more treatments are being compared within the same trial. In each of these, there could be multiple groups. Um, in the, and then for each of these, there could be difference in the randomization unit. It could be patients or it'd be a cluster where you're randomizing groups rather than randomizing the individual. The second is the study hypothesis. The traditional study hypothesis is of superiority, where we think one treatment group is going to be better than the other. But there could be others, uh, the equivalence one, where we think the intervention group is not going to be better or worse than the other. The other is the equivalence, where we think the intervention is not going to be better or worse than the current control. And this is two one-sided hypothesis tests. And the third is non-inferiority, where we think the intervention will be non-inferior to the current therapy.
The third outcome is the nature of the outcome. So the nature of the outcome could be binary. And this is where, for example, it could be death or no death. It could be continuous. This is maybe a quality of life measure or blood pressure at a certain time point. It could be ordinal. And this is maybe related to your state of um, your health. Or it could be time to event. For each of these, there are statistical tests associated with these. And each of these will provide you with the sample size calculation from which you based your power calculation from. So for binary, for example, there could be the Fisher's exact test, the chi-square test, or the mantle hansel test. For a continuous outcome of blood pressure or quality of life scores, you could have a two-sample comparison of a t-test, a Mann-Whitney or Wilcoxon rank sum test, or an ANOVA. For the ordinal outcome, you could have a Mann-Whitney test. For time to event, the log rank test compares the survival distributions of the time to event, or you could have a difference in the re restricted mean survival time, which is the area under the Kaplan-Meier curve. The next thing that is required is the measure of variation. So the measure of variation in a binary outcome is just the event rates, uh, which um, primarily from the control group. For a continuous outcome, you need the measure of variation, which is the standard deviation of the variation of the mean. Uh, you need this in the control group and perhaps in the intervention group as well. And for time to event, either it's the median survival time or the survival time at time t. The next step is whether you're going to do a one or two sided test. This two sided test assumes that the null hypothesis is that the groups are equal and the alternative hypothesis is the groups are not equal. In a one sided test, you're just looking to see that the new intervention is better than the control. One of the more important aspects of sample size estimation is knowing the minimally clinically important difference for superiority trials especially. And for equivalence trials, it's the equivalence limit, meaning where the two treatment groups are shown to be not worse or not better than each other. And for the non-inferiority trial, it's a non-inferior limit where the intervention group can be not worse than the control group by this specific limit. The minimally clinically important difference is a hard measure to estimate. It can be the difference that is required for a change in patients' lives. It can be the difference that is required for a change in current practice. Or it could be a difference that what the stakeholders think is important. The next component is the alpha and beta errors. The alpha and beta errors are false positive or false negative errors. Generally, the alpha error is set to 0 0.01, 0 0.025, or 0 0.05, while the beta error is set to 0 0.2 or 0 0.1. And this is a figure which shows the null hypothesis distribution and the alternative hypothesis distribution and the alpha errors as well as the beta error and the power is 1 minus the beta error. Power is the probability of rejecting your null hypothesis given that it's false. Power is usually set between 80 and 90. That gives a beta of 0.2 and 0.1 respectively. Power of 80% that means that you will reject your null hypothesis 4 out of 5 times if the trial was repeated several times. So sample size estimates are time consuming, justifying the input into the sample size estimates are more challenging than the actual sample size calculation itself. Sample size calculations are not the only things that statisticians are good for. It is as much an art as a science, and it is approximate. If you have given thought about all these things and have justified these estimates related to the study, then you are ready to begin sample size estimation. So here are some examples of sample size estimation in trials. So this is a general formula uh, of sample size estimation where 
The S is the measure of variation. The delta is the clinically important difference. And um, the standard normal distributions for the alpha error and the beta error. So let's look at an example. Here we believe we have an educational intervention that will improve the scores on a standardized test compared to the normal program. We want to design a superiority trial to assess this. And we would like to know the amount of students that will be required for this. The measure of variation around the test scores is 10. We believe that the intervention program will improve the test scores by five units. We expect that 5% of students will not complete the test. We expect that 2% of students are going to cross from the intervention program to the control program. And furthermore, 3% will cross over from the control program to the intervention program. So the inputs for the standard sample size calculation are the measure of variation, which is 10, the minimally clinically important difference is 5. The level of significance we're going to pick for this, or alpha, is 0.05, and it's going to be a two-sided test. We would like 80% power, so the beta is 0.2, and then the loss to follow-up and crossover, as previously mentioned. This is a parallel group randomized trial. It is superiority. The nature of the outcome is continuous, as it's a continuous score. The control group mean we don't have, but it's not required in this case. We have a minimally clinically important difference of five that we have thought would be good enough so that we can implement the intervention program if the trial does show that it's better. The measure of variation or the standard deviation is 10. We're going to use a t-test to compare the scores, alpha of 0.05 two-sided and power of 80%. So if we were to plug this into the general formula, we would have 16 times 10 over 5 all square, and that will give us a sample size of 64 per group and a total sample size of 128. So in practice, and generally in many trials, we have loss to follow up. So participants, patients, students will be lost to follow up, or they may drop out of the study. It is good that at the design stage that we increase the sample size to account for this loss to follow up. For example, if the probability of dropping out is x and your sample size is n, then the sample size accounting for the loss to follow up is n over 1 minus x. So in our example, our total sample size was 128 and we anticipated that 5% would be dropped out so the revised sample size would be 128 divided by 0.95, which is 1 minus 0.05, to give us a total sample size of 136. So here we have inflated the sample size to account for the loss to follow up in potential students. Similarly, crossover may happen in the trial. It impacts power and it dilutes the treatment effect. So we need to inflate the sample size to account for this crossover. In this case, the sample size is adjusted by a square term of one minus the crossover. So for in our example now, after adjusting for loss to follow up, we have a sample size of 136. Our crossover is 2% one way and 3% the other way. So our revised sample size will take one minus 0 0.02 minus 0 0.03 take the square of that and then divide it by uh, 136 to get a total of 151. So you can see our initial sample size was 128, but after adjusting for loss to follow up and crossover, our sample size now is at 151. The current sample size estimation example that I've shown you assumes that the treatment groups are going to be equal in numbers um, and so they're randomized one to one. But there may be cases that this may not be the trial design. In cases where you are trying to encourage recruitment to a intervention, you may want to change the allocation ratio to something that 
uh, favors the intervention group. In this case, you look at this formula to adjust for that inflation. So for example, in our trial example, we have, it was a one-to-one -one randomization, but now we're going to switch it to a two-to-one randomization where the intervention is given to uh, two-to-one to the control group. So for example, in our original sample size, the sample size was 64 per group, 128 total. However, now we're going to change the allocation to two to one. So we need to inflate it by the formula. And that formula, when you stick in K equals two to it, you get a sample size total of 144. Um, and this divided by the two to one allocation gives you 96 in the experimental group and 48 in the control group. So once you have done the sample size calculation, it is important that you report everything transparently so that individuals who are reading the sample size estimation in a grant or in a publication can hypothesize this. So you need to report the sample size per group, obviously the intervention rate and control group rate and the minimally difference, the measure of variation, and where you got these from. Justify these measures. Report the alpha and the power, the test used to compare to calculate the sample size, the hypothesis for your for your design, the amount of tails, the attrition, which is a loss to follow up, software and formula that you use to calculate the sample size, and a range of values for different estimates. Always important that you provide a range of values for, for example, for standard deviation and provide power calculations if those estimates vary slightly. So for our example of 128 students originally required, we would report it in such a way. So we have shown in the highlighted sections here in the bolded section that we have reported 80% power the minimum clean important difference is five points. We would include a justification. We have got the measure of variation from 10, and we would include a justification of where we got that from. The alpha level is 0.05, two-sided. We say that the tests were based on a t-test, where the null hypothesis is that there's no difference between the treatment groups. Um, we have said that we assume 5% follow-up, loss to follow-up and 5% crossover, and therefore we need 151 students to be recruited. And then power calculations were done using a formula or a software, depending on how you did them. And then you would put in a table varying the estimates of standard deviation, for example, and showing the power estimation for that. Just to be conservative, it's always good to take the largest measure of variation as long as the trial is feasible, and that is a conservative approach. So we have gone through the estimation for sample size for a continuous variable. Let's move on to the binary outcome. Let's assume that the proportions in, of positive responses in each group are PT and PC, or P1 or P2. And therefore, P hat, which is the average, is just PT minus PC over 2. The delta, which is the clinically important difference, is then PT minus PC. And the standard deviation is P hat 1 minus P all square root. OK, this is an approximate sample size estimation. Now, suppose the outcome is not a test score, but the pass rate of the standardized test. And we're going to estimate that in our intervention group, the pass rate is going to be 80%. And in our control group, it's going to be 70%. So using that same general sample size calculation that we had previously discussed, the delta here now is 0.1, which is 0.8 minus 0.7. Um, and the standard deviation is now 0.1. If we stick that into the general sample size formula, that's going to be about 16 times 0.19 divided by 0.1 squared, which gives us 298 participants required for this. Now, I've given you a general sample size estimation. If you were to do this using a Fisher's exact test, the sample size would be 313 per group, 
if you had done it using a mental Hensel test, um, it would have been 294 per group. Given the same alpha, which was 0.052 sided, and the same power, which was 80%. So you can see that different statistical tests will give you slightly different sample size estimations for the same parameters put in. And that's fine. So the two examples that we've gone through before are for trials where the individual is being randomized. However, there are cluster randomized trials where we randomize on a group level, but inferences are made on the individual level. The lack of independence among these individuals within the same group makes sample size estimation and trial a bit more complex. There is between cluster dependence and within cluster variation. Now a cluster may be a village, it may be a city, it may be a clinic, it may be a classroom, or it just may be a physician's clinic. So examples of within cluster dependence. Individuals within a cluster may frequently interact and therefore their responses to a particular outcome may be similar. And that brings up correlation. This may be classrooms or entire schools or communities. Individuals frequently select clusters or groups to which they belong. Patients' characteristics may be related to a medical practice and may be related to physician characteristics. Important covariates at the cluster level may affect individuals within the cluster in the same manner. For example, temperature in nursing nurseries uh, may be related to infection rates within those nurseries. So the correlation basically reduces the effective sample size. If you think of it in a randomized trial, each patient or participant is providing independent information. Here in a cluster randomized trial, it is not independent, it's correlated, and therefore you need to inflate the sample size to adjust for that correlation. The higher the correlation within clusters, the larger the sample size that is required. Correlation is usually estimated using the interclass correlation coefficient, and therefore the sample size must take that into account. Secondly, it must account the number of clusters, whatever that may be, whether it's classrooms or villages or hospitals, and it must incorporate the cluster size. The intraclass correlation coefficient captures the essence of clustering. It is a proportion of the between divided by the between plus within variation. If the within variation is zero, there is no variation in outcomes and the ICC is one. If the between variation is zero, groups are similar and the ICC is zero. How does one estimate the ICC? It can be from literature, it can be a range of estimates. In general, and there are exceptions to this, the ICC for human studies is generally less than 0.05. The number of clusters in a trial can be fixed. For example, if you're looking at cities in a specific province like Ontario, it can be determined based on feasibility. However, the number of, the number of cluster size could be also fixed. It could be the number of students in a classroom or a population of a village, but it could also vary between clusters. This, the ICC can be get from previous literature. There is many publications that have presented ICC for different interventions and different outcomes. So for example, here you see ICCs presented for nutritional interventions in schools. This is a paper presenting estimates of uh, ICC from uh, the Robert Wood Johnson prescription for health projects. Here is another paper presenting ICCs for heart failure and another one presenting it for cardiovascular prevention. If you are not familiar with what the ICC is, then generally you use a range and the range could be you know, from 0 0.01 to 0 0.05 for human studies and look at the implications of power based on that. So generally what we do and for cluster randomized trials is that we have to inflate the sample size to adjust for this clustering. 
So we're going to use a simple strategy here, and this is not the only strategy, and this is the basic strategy, where we take a sample size calculation for an individually randomized trial, and then we inflate it based on the correlation. So let's say here the N SRT is the sample size for a standard randomized trial. And what we want to do here is calculate the sample size for a cluster randomized trial. And basically, we calculate the number of clusters with average size M. So the patients or students in the cluster are average size as M. And how we do that is basically we take the number of patients that would be required for a standard randomized trial, multiplied by the various inflation factor, divided by the average cluster size. Now the variation inflation factor is given by the formula of 1 plus all brackets the average cluster size minus 1 multiplied by the ICC. And this takes into account the clustering. So once you multiply this by the standard uh, number, you get the number of patients required for a cluster randomized trial. So this is a simplification of the formula where the right side of the formula shows that the sample size for the cluster randomized trial is the sample size for a standard randomized trial multiplied by the various inflation factor. So let's look at an example here. And this was not a uh, cluster randomized trial, but we're going to use it as an example. And it was a large factorial trial of warfarin versus aspirin in preventing disease. So let's consider that the outcome here is cholesterol levels of patients within uh, physician practices. Each, the average physician practice size was 50 patients. So we have this information from other sources that the variation within was 1.2 and the variation between was 0.046. So we can calculate a ICC based on the formula, giving it an ICC of 0.036. And now one may think that this is very small. We'll come to show you that it has quite a big impact. So for our standard randomized trial, now we are going to use um, the significance or alpha level of 0.05 two-sided, but power of 90% and therefore this number jumps from 16 to 21 and then it's the similar formula that you've seen before where we multiplied by the variation divided by the clinically important difference. So we see the ICC as before is 0.036, the average cluster size is 50 patients and therefore our variation inflation factor based on our formula is now 1.16. Now let's assume that we're going, our minimally clinically important difference is 0.1 units. Our standard RCT would therefore with 90% power will give us a sample size of 2,700 patients per arm. Now to get a sample size for a cluster design, we would take that 2,700 patients, multiply it by the various inflation factor to get a sample size of 3,180 patients. If we were to divide that by the average cluster size of 50, we would require 64 medical practices. So you can see that here, there's an inefficiency in the cluster design, that it requires more patients than a standardized, standard randomized trial because of that correlation. So although it is an inefficient design, sometimes it's required because you can only randomize groups and not individuals because of contamination and other issues. The next sort of trial that we're going to discuss are pilot trials and there is a major difference between these trials and uh, phase two, phase three, or phase four randomized trials. Generally in these trials there's no formal hypothesis testing and therefore we don't really require power calculations. There has been many approaches to determining sample size for pa uh, pilot studies. There's a confidence interval approach, which I will show you later. And there are many other approaches 
to do this. Some that we can see on the slide um, that have been proposed over the over the years are require 50% of the total sample size, some require 10 patients, some require a minimum of 20 patients or 12 patients, some say at least 55, some say at least 9% of the mean trial sample. So there's various approaches to developing sample size for pilot trials. So based on the approaches described previously, assume that the trial, main trial, sample size is about 1,000 patients using a binary outcome. You can see that there is variation in the pilot study sample size based on these previously described approaches. It can vary from 90 to 500. Many of these, not all of these, are approaches to estimate the variability in the outcome. However, what if the objective of the trial is to measure assess feasibility? For example, compliance rate, recruitment rate, then we're not really interested in the measure of variability of the primary outcome, but we're interested in feasibility. We're interested in feasibility. This can be done using precision, and by that means estimating a confidence interval around the feasibility outcome, and then calculating a sample size based on that. So for example, we want to estimate a sample size for a randomized trial where one of the primary feasibility outcomes is compliance. We assume that the compliance will be about 70% and we will tolerate a margin of error of about 10%. We would like to use a 95% confidence interval approach to estimate the sample size. So this is a free online calculator uh, where we put in our expected proportion, which is 0.7 related to the compliance. The margin of error or precision we think is going to be, we would tolerate 0.1, and then the 95% confidence level. And once we do that, we can put it in, and the sample size is now 81. So we require 81 patients, uh, around 40 per group, to reasonably estimate the compliance uh, with a precision that we are comfortable with for this study. So again, if we were to report this, we would say be very transparent, saying we use a 95% confidence interval, assuming 70% of the participants will be compliant, and we will tolerate a margin of error of 10%, and we would need 81 patients for the trial. It is important to know that this sample size estimation is not sufficient to make statistical comparisons between the groups. So when you analyze the trial, this will be a descriptive analysis based on the feasibility outcomes and not a statistical test based on primary outcome that would be the primary outcome for the main trial. So, for, so far, we have discussed randomized trials. We have gone through individual randomized trials with binary and continuous outcomes. We've gone through a cluster trial where we're randomizing groups rather than individuals. And we have gone through pilot trials, which are general feasibility, and we're looking at feasibility outcomes where there is no statistical testing of primary outcomes. Now we're going to briefly talk about surveys and estimation of sample size for surveys. So sample size estimation for surveys depends on the aim of the study, obviously the resources and feasibility of conducting the study, as well as the statistical quality of the study. If a statistical analysis is going to be performed, then it's important that you have a sample size estimation and justification for the survey. So the outcome measure, it can be a proportion, for example, people with asthma, it can be a, a mean, it can be the average population height. It can be an average quality of life of the population. We're going to use the same sort of process that we use for pilot studies to estimate the sample size for this. And that uses a precision approach that we have described, but we will go through it again. So again, you need a margin of error. In other words, what is the maximum error between the true difference and your own estimate? The confidence limit level, here we generally pick 
but it can be 90% if that's what we choose. And it's not always important to have the population size, but you may have it at some point. For example, if you are going to look at a population that is a school, then you would know the population uh, of that. Um, so here is a sample size formula, and this is basically the formula that is used in that online statulator that we use for the pilot studies. And this is basically one where you have a margin of error, the confidence interval limit, and the proportion. And the, the confidence interval limit is just the standard normal distribution of the z value, um, and that's 1.96. The assumed proportion is what we think it will be. For example, if we're looking for um, the proportion of patients with asthma in a single population and the margin of error. So here is an example. We're looking to estimate the prevalence of HIV in Ontario. We assume that the HIV prevalence is about 5%. Our margin of error, which we will tolerate, is 3%. And we're looking at a 95% confidence interval. So if we were to plug that into our sample size formula, we would get about 300 patients need to be recruited to estimate a prevalence of HIV of 5% with a margin of error of 3%. So what if you have several important questions you would like to answer within a survey? So HIV may be one, but there could be other diseases and conditions that you're also interested in. One approach is to estimate the sample size for each question based on a margin of error for each of them. You can have different margin of errors for each question, and then you can pick the largest sample size. This will provide adequate precision for all the questions. Picking the lowest sample size will be challenging because you may not have enough precision for the estimates for all the other conditions which require larger sample size. So from the previous example, say the prevalence for HIV was five, the margin of error was three, and we used a 95% confidence interval, the sample size required was 203. However, now assume that there's another condition where the prevalence is about 15%, and we require the same margin of error of 3%, and we're gonna use a 95% confidence interval, if we plug that into the previous formula, we will see that the sample size for this condition um, with the tolerance that we have described is 545 patients. So if you're going to do a study, looking at these two combined, one would pick 545 because it would provide adequate precision for the second condition as well as the HIV. So now we move on to sample size for cohort studies. There are a few options to do this. One is to use the precision approach around a single proportion, which we have described um, for prevalence of uh, binary outcomes in surveys. And we have also described this as in the pilot studies using um, compliance as an example. The second approach is to use a power approach to detect a difference of effect between exposure and non-exposure. That can, be a diff that can be an effect using a risk difference, a relative risk, or an odds ratio. Or you could use a precision approach around the me these measured e effects. The decision should be made around the aim of the study. So for, for a cohort study, one can look at this two by two table, which shows the cases and non-cases and exposed as non-exposed. In general, you'd like to know the proportion of exposed that are cases and the proportion of non-exposed that are cases to give you an estimate of sample size. You can then base it on formula that are similar to RCTs. However, in cohort studies, there could be a difference in the number of patients exposed versus non-exposed, and this will affect the sample size. As we had so seen in the sample size calculation for RCTs, if there is imbalance in the exposed versus non-exposed, this will require more patients. So just to recap, 
You can do this based on estimation precision, which is a 95% confidence interval around a single proportion, for example, just the cases in the exposed group, or you can do it for a effect between the exposed and the non-exposed, and this effect can be risk difference, relative risk, or odds ratio. And for each of those, you could either base it on a power approach where you estimate the sample size based on 80% power, for example, in a two-sided um, alpha of 0.05, or you could also base it on a precision around those effects. So in summary, sample size estimation should be based on the research question and the study design. Sample size estimation formula are the easy part of sample size calculations. The challenging and more difficult part is inputs and justification of the parameters that go into the formula. It is always important to vary these estimates to get a sense of whether power will be maintained given different assumptions of variation or treatment effects. And it's always important to involve a biostatistician early in the process to help you with this. Thank you very much for listening to this talk on sample size estimation. I hope you found it useful.